By show of hands, how many people here have suffered a significant personal loss in your life? Wow. Thank you. I'm blessed enough to be able to speak to small groups, to large groups, and it always seems to be about 80 or 90% of the people in the room raise their hand. I'd like to tell you about one of the significant personal losses in my life. It was September 29th, 1998. It was a Tuesday. I woke up and I looked over to my right and I couldn't find Dana, my wife. I didn't know where she was. And just then, Connor, my four-year-old, comes running and where's mom? I don't know. Let's go find her. So we walk down the hallway and Kyle, my 14-year-old, comes in. Same question. Let's find her. We walk down, we look downstairs, we see her down in front of the washer and dryer. She's kind of all curled over. Doesn't look good. We go running down there. I turn her over and there's stuff coming out of her mouth and doesn't look good. Connor starts crying. I said to Kyle, Kyle, go call the fire department. Call the medics, call whatever. And within a matter of five or 10 minutes, there must have been 15 or 20 people in our house. And they had all those wires and tubes and all that elect charge thing. And, and again, for those that raise their hand or those that know what something like this is like, one of the things that happens is that you lose all track of time. Time loses all measure. And this little short fire person comes over to me and says, Mr. Brooke, we've been working on your wife for an hour and a half, and we still don't have any heartbeat. Would you like us to continue? And I realized at that point I'd never before had faced making a life and death decision for somebody else. And I said, no, you can stop. And she was dead. She was 38 years old. And one of the things that I found through something like that, it wasn't just Dana's death. I had suffered so many losses along the way. My father earlier had killed himself. My mother had died of cancer. Friends in high school, that just this list went on and on and on. I remember thinking, how am I gonna cope with this? I'm gonna have to figure something out here at some point because within a couple of days of, of Dana's death, I walked upstairs and I walked out in this little deck we had and I remember just pinching my skin and just going, I'm just a little guy trying to get through life. And I don't know if I can do this. And I kind of looked up at the sky and I thought, now I see why people kill themselves. I never have thought that before in my life. But I gave it a few more minutes of thought and I thought, I'm not doing that though. I'm not going to do that. And once you remove something like that off the table, it's no longer something that is a choice. I've got to raise these two boys and I'm going to move forward. What had happened with Dana, she got uh, hooked on prescription medication. At one point, she was like arrested and I have a picture of our, uh, of our wedding and wonderful woman. But ultimately, that was what took her life. And I realized as I started to process this over time and as, as numbness wears off and, and you get on your life, and this is not a nightmare, this is, this, this is actually reality. It really comes down to your perspective and how you look at something, and we have a choice in our life. So I would like you to ask you all just to stand up for a second, if you'd be so kind, and I would like you to just take your right hand and extend it. It's always good to get a little stretch early in the morning and start turning it in a clockwise manner. Now, we're in a digital world, so if anybody needs any help, there's a clock face. That's clockwise. Now just start bringing it down real slowly. Keep it going clockwise. Just start bringing it down real slowly to the top of your head, your eyes, your chin, your chest, and your waist. Now what direction is it going? Bueller? <laughs> Anybody counterclockwise? Yes, it is. Okay, you can sit down. Thank you for participating in that. It changed my perspective completely changed how I looked at things. Very similarly, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I had a different perspective. I needed things to help me change. I realized, too, that how this was going to affect Connor and Kyle, and how they were going to be as they went through it, and I started realizing that eventually you're going to have to hang in there, and it takes as long as it takes, is what I realized. I started to get this idea about gratitude, and then that became something even bigger, a gratitude journal, which I'll chat about in a second. But it was this, it takes as long as it takes. I am 63 years old. Now, somebody may look at, God, he doesn't look a day over 62, but, <laughs> but I am. And there's another famous guy that was 63 when he started KFC. 
So each one of you has your own path. You never, ever, ever want to give up, ever. With the help of Jesus, with the help of a gratitude journal, with the help of embracing gratitude, that attitude, you can get through anything. It can be tough, but you can get through it. But I realized Connor was really struggling. And he was in school, and I had to hold him back in first grade. It was just tough. And I'm raising these two boys by myself without Dana. And then one day the gal says, well, we need to assess Connor. He's not doing very well. I said, his mother just died six months ago. Well, yeah, but he's not doing real well. So they went and put him through all these tests and these different things. And when it was all over, he was bouncing balls and stuff like that. They had him go wait in the other room, and I talked to the lady, and she said, uh, uh, he's going to have a tough time in life. He's not going to do well in school, not going to do well at all. We're going to give him all these different little occupational therapy things, but he's not going to do well. So I left, and oh, before I left, I said, you know, we live by Green Lake, and I said, he's going to be the quarterback at Roosevelt High School someday. She starts laughing. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. Never forgot it. So I walked out to the car and, and just burst into tears. I couldn't stop crying. Dad, why are you crying? I said, Connor, it's okay. Hang in there. But Connor kept struggling. He kept struggling and struggling, and I started to think they're probably right. But I wasn't gonna, gonna let that define him or me as his father or Kyle helping as much as he could his older brother. But everything just didn't work. School, it was tough. He starts playing baseball. Now, I always know there's a lot of parents in the room. When they play t-ball, okay, the, the ball doesn't move. It just sits right here. There's no curve, there's no, you know, fast. And Connor couldn't hit it. And he'd sit and he'd go like this and he, I go, Connor, the ball's here. I know, Dad, hang on. And then eventually lowers it enough, and then he hits the tee, the ball dribbles forward. Dad, I got a hit. <laughs> Connor, it's not, that's not quite the idea. But he kept trying. He kept trying and trying and trying. And then eventually he's about 10, 11 years old, wasn't even playing that much. He always kept trying. He'd always go out for a little league. Couldn't hit, couldn't throw, couldn't catch, couldn't run. Other than that, pretty good. So we get to this game, May 31st, 2005. He was about 10, 11 years old, and it's seven to six, the other team. It's the bottom of the seventh. There's a guy in second and third, two outs. I look, oh boy. Guess who comes out of the dugout? Now, the other kids never pay attention to their parents. Connor looks up at me, Dad, I'm up. <laughs> Walks over and swinging the bat like he's Babe Ruth or something. Ball one, ball two, ball two, ball three, ball four, or ball three, I should say. Full count. Next pitch comes in. He just rips it down the third baseline. Goes just inside the bag, and the guy from third comes in, scores. The guy from second rounds, here comes the ball, the guy, the catcher. They all come together, crash. The ball pops out. They win the game. Connor's standing out on second once again. Dad, got a hit. <laughs> Go, Connor, most kids don't acknowledge their parents in the stands. That's usually the way it works. But the entire team walked out and put them on their shoulders and carried them off the field. I never forgot it. And I think they have a, yeah, there he is when he was. But he went on to keep struggling and keep trying, but he never gave up. He got better and better in school. He had this, I'm not going to give up, and hopefully he got it from me, from his brother, from our belief about you can't give up. And he kept trying, and he was student of the year at his junior high, and then he graduated, Bothell High School. Oh, and, oh, and by the way, on the, boss, on the uh, baseball team, leadoff hitter. Tremendous hitter in his last year. Now he's in college in San Diego. But it's so important. And one of the things I taught the boys too, and anybody that'll listen, is that embrace gratitude. It takes as long as it takes. I don't care how old you are. I've had this dream of being a speaker for 44 years. I don't care what it took. Every one of your paths are different. Just allow it to be that way but you've also got to clean out your brain and make room for gratitude. You got to get rid of the junk. When you go outside today, there's this windshield you have out there. It's about this deep and it's about this wide. It's big. And then notice how big the rearview mirror is. That's about 100 to 1, something like that. Pay attention to what's behind. If there's blue lights, pull over. <laughs> it's okay. But mostly it's what's out in front of you. We run over junk, and then we take it from behind us, put it in front of us, and run over it again. Now, in the case of me, 
you want to make sure you don't park too close to where Connor is because that's what happened to my windshield. Once you understand that and you make that decision, I'm going to clear out my brain. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I got a gratitude journal. And a friend of mine says to me, do you know what a gratitude journal is? And I said, no. And he said, what is it? And he goes, well, it's a journal you write in every single day for what you're grateful for. Okay. And he says, you're messed up. You haven't been the same since Dana died. And he was right. So I got a gratitude journal. I started writing in it, and I started noticing amazing things happening because you're reframing everything that you have in your life versus what you don't have. We're constantly bombarded with messages. If you only had this or that, you'll be happy, successful, whatever it may be. But we don't frame it with what we have. And one of the things that I noticed is that a life worth living is worth recording. This takes seven to eight minutes a day is all it takes. Less than eight minute abs. And one of the things that I noticed is that the younger generation says, this is super, do you have an app? Well, yeah, there's an app, but it's not the same. If you think about it, it's like a dream. If you talk about it, it inspires you, but if you write it down, I am so grateful to God. I am so grateful to Gold Creek for inviting me. I am so grateful to Pastor Dan. It doesn't matter. It frames it, it focuses, and it puts it in your heart. Everything that we think about starts with a thought in our brain, goes to our heart, our arm, our hand, our pen to the paper. It's like a visceral connection. Same reason why we took notes in school. It's something about putting it together. I have an exercise I get to do when I ask people, what's your daily number? 10 is one of the best days of your life. One is one of the tougher days of your life. What's your daily number? You could all think about it right now. Where am I on that one to 10 scale? And then I ask people, think about what you're really grateful for. What are you most grateful for? Now again, this is too big of a group so I won't have people shout it out, but oftentimes it's health, family, friends, faith, jobs, houses. I do these little gratitude videos all the time and people, how do you keep coming up with a new idea? Really? There's a finite number of things to be grateful for? I did one video on my furnace because it was so cold out. I was excited the house was toasty. There's so many things to be grateful for. So what I realized after doing this is that there was one day I got up and I was a two. My mother, who had died of cancer, I mentioned a lot of loss in my life, was manic depressive, and when I was in school, she would call me and go like this. Uh, I have the sleeping pills. I'm going to take these unless you come over right now. So I would tell my teacher or the guy I was working for, I have to go take care of my mom. She's sick. So I think I got some of that from her, that manic depressive thing, bipolar, I believe it's called now. But you've got to figure out ways to deal with this. And so I woke up about a year and a half ago and I was at two. I wasn't doing very well. So I grabbed my journal, went to Starbucks, takes seven, eight minutes, as I mentioned. I started writing everything I was grateful for, and I got up to about a five or a six. Then I go do a talk. It's a chamber of commerce up north, Burlington. And after it was done, this lady comes up to me, and she says, uh, you just changed my life. And it's a very powerful thing to hear that from somebody, but I also realized Janice was her name. I said, I didn't change your life. These are tools. This gratitude journal is a tool. This Bible, what our Bible tells us, it's another way to help you. I talked to a gentleman earlier today, and he said, we get to worship on Sunday. What are we doing Monday through Saturday? Are we mindful of our blessings? So I was at the talk, and she gives me a hug, and I, I go out, and I get in the car, and I realized now I'm, now I'm a nine. I've gone from a two to a five to six to a nine. I was just had a big smile on my face and I just felt so great and I noticed that something like this wasn't involved. This wasn't involved. All these ways we have to cope which are so destructive. Dana's was pills as well. Vicodin and all that stuff had taken her life. So once you understand that, the power of a gratitude journal, it's an extremely healthy coping mechanism in this world of all these deadly destructive ones. One of the last pieces is getting sharing gratitude. 
Anything you share, your life is so much more fulfilling when you get to share it. You ever wonder who your best friend is? Who's the first person you call when you get really good or really bad news? That's how you know. And when you realize that you want to share it, so I thought, I need to share so many experiences in life. One example, I was going to go skydiving. So I got seven guys together and I made an appointment for skydiving out in Issaquah. And then pretty soon it was seven guys. And then we were down to six. And then about midweek, a couple of guys called, <coughs> excuse me, I think I have a sore throat. I don't think I can make it on Saturday. So finally on Saturday I show up and I go, Brooke, party of eight for the skydiving? He goes, uh, where's all your friends? I went, I uh, don't have any. It's just me. And I went by myself. But it wasn't the same. You don't get to share it. And that's what's so critical about that. I would ask you today to share something. I don't get very good cell service in here. We don't, I should say. I call this the four T's. Sometime today, I would like you to text, tweet, telephone, or tell somebody in your life how grateful you are for them. Let them know. I hear this all the time. We don't tell the people around us enough how grateful we are for them. So please do that. I would also ask you to think about your life's legacy, your destiny, and especially, too, what are you doing with the gifts that God has given you? And just think about it privately. I feel I've been called to this message of telling people how you can come back I always point to my shoes and I go, I'm not teaching out of some book. I walk down this path. We cannot walk in each other's shoes, but we can walk in parallel paths. And when you can bounce back from that and with the help of the Lord and the help of a gratitude journal and the help of support around you, anything is possible. And I think about how unbelievably grateful I am for the opportunities that I've had, even though there's been a lot of tragedy. I even have a gratitude rock etched in granite And that's how I feel about gratitude. It's how I feel about God. It's how I feel about Jesus Christ. Be grateful for your health. Be grateful for your family and friends. But most of all, be grateful to God. Without God, we'd have nothing to be grateful for. So I'd like to ask Pastor Dan to head back out here to close us up for today. So much of this is the belief in the community and I've known Pastor Dan for a number of years and the help that we want to give people and the help that people can give each other and having something like gratitude, that belief in God and in Jesus can make such a difference.